Good evening, bro. <laughs> Good evening, Richard. Nice to you. Of course. So this is going to be our first uh, kind of a joint podcast, finally. It's neither you interviewing me nor me interviewing you, but it's going to be a conversation between the two of us. It's really a pleasure, Leloy, to kick off this, hopefully, uh, what I hope will be a, a kind of a productive project and, again, a pioneering one, hopefully. Yes. Do our best. Yes. Yeah. And I think what we're going to do today is we're really just trying to frame the series because Richard and I, we love thinking about our country. I mean, we absolutely love our country, but we also love to read about the world. And we take seriously the fact that the Philippines is not has never been isolated from the world and should be talked about in conjunction with the world. I mean, if you think about things like, for example, the, the beginning of the galleon trade, and if you think about the galleon trade as the first trading route in the Pacific, you know, the, some people believe that that was the moment globalization started. So in a way, globalization started in Manila. So we really can't think about the Philippines if we can't think about it globally. So that all, this long introduction is really my way of saying that our topic today is in what Richard has alluded to before, the topic of Philippine exceptionalism. This, this idea of, may kantanon dati, Richard, di ba? Only, only, only uh, in the Philippines. Di ba? Yeah. Yun yung, yun yeah. yung, ano, Philippine exceptionalism. Ano yung para, para sa'yo? Ano, ano, ano yung Philippine exceptionalism? Yeah, I'll go to that because I just want to plug in again about wh- why are we doing this to begin with. No? Kasi, di ba, Lelo, na-notice natin. Thank you very much for that pitch uh-huh. here. I mean, na notice natin that there's a tendency for us to overemphasize the peculiarities or you know uh, of our countrymen and our country, right? Which we do have peculiarities. The ba nagbiro na there's this map of top sports of Asian countries like football, 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 and then may isalang basketball. And you know what? Oh. There was a funny comment sa niya. Kasi gusto ng Pilipino, instant gratification. Kasi oh, football oh, daw, oh. walang goal for 90 minutes. Oh, sabi, ko, sabi ko, di ba, naghihintay ka sa, ng, dalaw, ng dalawang oras sa traffic, huwag ka na maghintay ng isang oras para sa goal. <laughs> exactly, like, shoot again, shoot again. Oh, right? So, we're so, not denying those peculiarities. But ang naisip namin, and I think, Lelo, you have a lot to share on this, is that I just felt, um, in, in my line of job, no, uh, populism, you know, democ- democracy, etc. I always try to compare what's happening in the Philippines with what I believe are comparable countries like Brazil, India, Turkey, Indonesia. And some of these countries I've known much better than the others. And the others I had to learn more about. And, and pansin ko lang, parang hindi siya ganong ka in sa atin. No? Like, I, 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 in fairness, I didn't see very strong pushback, but I just felt it was not fully appreciated or it's not a framework of analysis that is commonly used. While abroad, I saw a lot of people from India, Turkey, and all very interested, you know, when I raised those kind of comparative points, or in Indonesia for that matter. So I felt that there's this, this thing, genuinely unique thing about us, uh, thinking that we're really, really unique, right? And that reminded me of what you were talking about, which is yung, yung sense of Philippine exceptionalism. And that, that became very important in the context of Dutertismo no? and present Duterte's term, which we'll talk about more. So I just felt, why not that could be a takeoff, a whole podcast series and collaboration between us, whereby we'll discuss global issues that have a Filipino uh, angle to it, or what are these global issues have implications for the Philippines, which for sure they have. So yun gusto natin gawin. And we hope in that sense, this could uh, spare a... Uh, not a new intellectual movement necessarily, but a kind of a new approach uh, uh, or a kind of new epistemology to understanding issues in the Philippines. Chilang, sorry for the long introduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, and, yeah. And, and just to add to that, like, yung kalaban natin dito is the perception of elit- elitism, right? Mm. In Philippine English, elitism. Um, so, there's the sense na kung cosmopolitan ka, kung gusto mo yung abroad, di makakanduran ka and therefore you're not taking the philippines in its own terms and you know in our previous episode you said nga na sometimes our tendency to compare indeed manifests as elitism we're not immune to that like yung mga hirit na ang third world mo naman like mga hirit that both of us have said so it's not as if we're immune to that and i think we're both like self critical and sometimes even self lacerating enough to know that venturing into this topic can appear elitist to some people yep. but the goal of these conversations is to show na 
natural mag-compare. Hindi siya, it's not elitist, it's not outside the realm of Philippine discourse. It actually comes intuitively. Um, gaya nga na nasabi ni Rizal, di ba? Los demonios de comparacion. Yeah, it's the ultimate really... comparison. It's not something you choose. It's just It just happens the moment you read about the world. And so while we encourage our listeners to kind of think about the Philippines, we also encourage them to think about the world. And in the process of thinking about the Philippines, for me, automatic mangyayari comparison. It's not something that you have to impose on yourself. Like, I'm going to compare mangyayari yan, mangyayari pare ang multo. So, uh, conceptually, you know, now that we've kind of outlined what we want to do for this podcast, I might ask you, Richard, like, what for you is Philippine exceptionalism? And ano yung latest example ng Philippine exceptionalism na nakita mo na medyo kind of irks you a little bit? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I noticed this uh, Philippine exceptionalism thing Uh, both the more anodyne version or a slightly annoying version and the more and on the other hand the more troubling version no uh, so sa isang banda naalala ko every time may mga powerpoint presentation even yung mga kunyari webinars or uh, seminar seminars uh, for instance workshops for mga academics parati yung mga joke ganito sa Pilipinas you know the traffic lights are supposed to be prescriptive not proscriptive you know what like, like it's up to you to follow it and, and not and of course ako, at the back of my head like Have you been to India? Like, you know, oh, saying, like yeah. there's my ungoy na dadan, my kalabaw na dadan. You know, like everyone is punking. You know, if oh. you've been to other developing countries, you realize the film is not the worst. Like Middle Easterns are the worst drivers on earth. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, like any, you go to Tehran, Istanbul, you go to Cairo, and then don't pass on my Middle Eastern country. My goodness, you say my hotel is here? No, 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 you're there. And then it turns Kanila all the way around. I can speak a little bit Arabic and I can read. So I can say, no, 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 this, like this. You know, so, so like I'm telling you, there's nothing unique about the Philippines when it comes to mga kalokohan na gano'n, di ba? It's way worse. So that's the more anodyne, annoying, that self-deprecating one that I felt never really helps the Philippines in terms of raising our confidence level. But of course, it, it, it's in the humor. Like we can turn it into a kind of joking and parang only in the Philippines. You know, there's a humor Bakawa. that enlivens you, and then there's a humor that deflates your sense of self. I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm reading too much into it. Pero yun ang napansin ko na ah pinoy hanggang kalokohan. Like for instance, like you know, I have relatives or cousins who are abroad, de ba? And then we talk about Filipino stuff. It's always always about the kalokohan of Filipinos. I told them. Eh, di ba, ganun din yung mga, ano, yung mga ibang bansa na Asian, ay sa bagay, mas loko-loko sila. Or yung mga Americano, gano'n. Well, like, I make jokes like that because I don't want to to feel uh, parang helpless, not parang this is in our DNA to be problematic, etc. Because it deprives us of our sense of agency, right? And the sense that we can improve. And then for me, you know, while hearing that, of course, being an Ilocan, I always hear also, oh, Philippines used to be number two in Asia, blah, 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 Marcos time, golden age. So, parang, how's that? Kung ganyan tayo ka hopeless, and at the same time, you're saying we're the number two during Marcos. So, what are you implying here? You get what I'm saying? And I felt that was not well. So, this is the anodyne version pa, Leloy, na I'm sure you can oh, see. Oh, what's, what's the serious version? Like, serious what's the one during version? President Duterte, right? So, I remember, like, this was weird, bro. So, I would post um, data about effect of different drugs. Diba? Remember, the idea is like kung nagsyabu ka, zombie ka na, so wala ka ng human rights. Yun yung sinasabi nila, di ba? So, hmm. kung na-EJ ka, ka, kumbaga, sorry na lang para sa bayan yan. Di ba? Alam mo yung ganun na logic. Uh-huh. Di ba? So ako, nag-post ako ng data na which kinds of drugs have the worst effect. So for instance, cocaine could have a worse effect than on you than let's say shabu, for instance. No? Uh, so, what Hindi naman pataka sa mga elitista. But actually, I was attacking the elitists because yung mga, yeah. sino ka afford ng cocaine, di ba? Yung mga, yeah. Yeah. Di ba? And then, you know what, mga sagot? Ay, that data is a Western data. It's not <laughs> applicable to... Like, wait lang, iba pa yung ano, chemistry ng tao uh, ng Pilipinas. Like, uh, uh, but, but, and I saw UP graduates making those uh, arguments, bro. Uh, 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 and, it, and then, I, and I will talk about Brazil. Like, this is... Or for instance, I'm sorry, Colombia. Di ba the president of Colombia wrote an NY uh, New York Times op-ed. Sinabi niya kay Duterte, hindi gagana itong violenteng proseso para, you know, supuin itong problema ng ano, pinagbabawal ng trouble. Ay, hindi. Iba po ang Pilipinas sa Colombia. Ganito tayo. Uh-huh. Ganito tayo. So, bakit may beauty queen din sila? Malapit tayo. <laughs> you know, I had to have jokingly say, uh-huh. hindi tayo malayo sa Colombia actually. Uh-huh. I watch Narcos to kind of feel, you know. Uh-huh. So, Don't ko nakita na medyo this is getting weird now where you cannot give any policy prescription from other case studies 
uh, from Portugal to Colombia mm-hmm. because they'll say, oh, Ibang Pilipinas. Diba? I mean, so, that's... So, this is getting crazy. Yeah. This is getting crazy and something has to be done about it. Yeah, my, my example naman of that is, is the that's pandemic. Right, yeah. right, when, when BBM said na pwede na magtanggal ng mask outdoors, everybody was like, oh my God, magkakaroon ng spike. By the way, walang spike <laughs> or walang spike in hospitalization. So the people who, who God, said na magkakaroon ng spike nag, pag nagtanggalan na ng mask, you sh- I think you should hold yourself accountable and tell the public why you went wrong because I saw many people predicting a spike um, after they removed masks outdoor. I also saw Can a lot of many people... Bro, predict- are these like medical pra- practitioner critics? Maram, kung, kung sino, some of them are data scientists, some of them are medical practitioners. This is very similar to those people who predicted na magkakaroon ng spike after the Lenny rally sa hindi nag-spike and then nobody held them accountable and they, they themselves didn't hold themselves accountable and explain to the public why they got it wrong. I don't know why they got it wrong. I'm not a medical expert, but they should have to be reflexive enough to assess that. But anyway, going back to this issue of um, no more mask outdoors, we were, I think, one of the last two in Southeast Asia to require masks outdoors. And the Southeast Asian experience of, of masking outdoors had already, already shown that the risk was kind of low. And that wasn't just in Southeast Asia. It was even in the United States and Britain. Like yeah. The trans- transmission was really, really low outdoors. But there was this sense among people na hindi, yung Filipino kasi uniquely lacks discipline. Yeah, um, yun. yun uniquely pasawa. lacks discipline. Mm-hmm. Hindi mo siya pwedeng ipag-unmask outdoors. Um, right. And of course, that that you also saw that doon sa pag-open ng schools. So, for example, the UNICEF already told the Philippine government that it was being very, very conservative with respect to the opening of schools. And right. then when Sarah Duterte decided to open schools, people were like, magkakaroon ng spike. Now, there are two reasons why they criticized, I think, yung reopening of schools. Mm-hmm. Number one, because there are some people in my pink camp, in our pink camp, I, I'd like to think that na infect tayo ng pink tayo pareho kahit pano, and we love, we love, we like Lenny. Um, <laughs> you know, some people in our camp, you know, some people in our political persuasion just don't like anything that the Duterte's do, right? So, automatically, that. that's one reason. But the other reason is pure Philippine exceptionalism. They're like, yeah, other countries can open their schools, but we can't because we are, we have a uniquely weak state. Never mind that many weak African states had opened their schools ahead of us. And to say that the that the Philippine state is weaker than some of the previously war-torn African states yeah. that had opened their schools, I mean, that's just absurd to me already. Yeah. I mean, not to mention, we're comparable to Indonesia, I would say, on, on many levels. And they always had a very different approach during the pandemic. And they didn't suffer as much economic damage. And as far as their overall numbers are concerned, it's not bad, no. Uh, bro, I want to get back to you on this no um you have been a cultural critic for quite some time no kind of d- doing your own zizek in, you know walang basagan ng trip etc you have done that and i noticed like there you were already noticing the peculiarities of the filipino political culture right or everyday culture and all pero natin idikit yan and then from there i want to go to your discussion and of course this is a conversation so we'll go back and forth on this i also very much like uh your work on how the Philippines, kasi ito, di ba, going back again to Duterte, yung idea na ang human rights, civil liberties, mga Western ideas yan, hindi yan applicable sa atin. And yet, you discuss how actually the Philippines, uh, through Salvador, you know, uh, you know Lopez, etc., was actually a big contributor to the development of the international human rights regime, right? Yeah. Under the ages of United Nations. Can we go to that? Kasi, so medyo basag, walang basagan ng trip, but at the same time, the more simple. Pero, yeah, yeah, yung, I think I've told this story numerous times but I'll yeah. keep telling it over and over again nung gusto ng United nung, nung gusto ng United Nations Council on Human Rights na investigahan right. yung pagwar ni Duterte sabi na Malacanang that is a foreign the United Nations is is imposing its values on us now the reason why the United Nations Council on Human Rights can investigate human rights violations anywhere or, or can be petitioned the right to petition or the obligation to petition the reason why that exists is because of the DFA of the Philippines. The yeah, DFA, exactly. That petition exactly. policy. Ginawa yeah. yun ni Jose Ingles, ni Salvador right. Lopez, ni Carlos P. Romulo. So that was not a foreign imposition. That was designed by your very own Department of Foreign Affairs and was very convenient for the Duterte uh, administration to either forget that or to just not know that. So yeah. yun, very clear case yun. Um, ako naman, babalikan naman kita. Ikaw, 
you actually started your public career, um, if I remember correctly, writing about the exciting events in the Arab Spring. So you actually yeah. became famous not talking about the Philippines and then biglang pumivot ka. Huh. Um, you started connecting that to the Philippines. I mean, yeah. What's that like? Because most of the time, from the Philippines, palabas, ikaw palabas, paloob. Yeah. No, for me, it was always a back and forth thing, a back and forth thing. I'll be honest about it. Yung, yung politika natin sa Pilipinas was nakakadismaya siya. I mean, let, let's be very honest. I, I don't oh, know so you were excited by the Arab Spring. I was excited like, by any revolution, any whole... events, right? Yeah. Uh, anything in history, whether it's 1848, whether it's, you know, 1789, 17... I was always I was always into those big things. And nakatawan lang 2010, uh, you know, nasa Egypt tayo. I was supposed to go to Gaza with Sila Walden, etc. And I suddenly like felt something is in the air, right? Because I was reading about the history of revolutions, conditions that come together to to make that happen. So my sense of, then I wrote something about uh, parang Egypt's impending political earthquake, right? This is like March. Wow. By December of that year. Wala na, iba na regime, di ba? So, and then I said like, hmm, maybe I'm onto something here, right? Uh -oh. Tignan lang napabilib ako sa sarili ko. Next thing, you know, I'm writing a book. And next thing, I know, you know. And th from there, things got kicked off. But actually, simultaneous to that, I was also beginning to write, not book level and all, but just on a more humble level uh, for international publications, like on the South China Sea, West Philippine Sea issue. Di ba? Kasi, uh, you know, I was working in the Congress, eh, also in the Senate, etc. So I was a little bit, also following the debates here. So I'm seeing all of this thing happen. It's like this convulsions in West Asia and, uh, in China. and then in China, we have the rise of a new empire, etc. And all of these things really interested me. But really when I got really obsessed about the Philippine politics and I tried to do that, you know, out, in, in, out and all of that was when I sensed Duterte is going to win and you, you, you're among the first people who sense my sense. Right? It's like, mm hmm, hmm. Something is going on here. And you uh, know what annoyed me, Lela? Because I saw... So just, just to put it on, on the record, kung gano ka advance si Richard sa akin, I said, unlikely, Richard said, dark horse. Uh, and, dark horse to win the president. And this is like so, second quarter of 2015, yeah. though, right? I mean, let's be yeah. fair to ourselves. This is not like December. This is second quarter, and no one was even talking about it. Uh, wala pa yung mga interview si Maria Reza sa kanya, di ba? <laughs> Which kind of put mm. you on the map. Let's just be honest about it. So... Oh, so for me, like, hmm, this is interesting because I kind of understand what's going on here because I've been following very closely the rise of Modi, uh, Ardoan, and also Jokowi, right? Because of my travels, because of connections, because of our think tank friends, progressive friends. So I, I heard a lot of Manilenio or Philippine experts, including colleagues in certain universities saying, now, Philippines will never vote for someone like that. You know, Filipinos are decent. Like, we're de facto liberals, right? In the sense that we'll never mm. vote for an openly authoritarian leader. That even Marcos had to put, you know, a fig leaf of democracy, uh, what he was doing. And he said, I'm not sure about that. Right? Uh, like, I'm looking at all of the similar countries to us, Indonesians, Indians, whatever. They're going down that road. Why not the Philippines, right? Mm. And then that's exactly what happened in the Philippines. And, and if you look at how I've analyzed Duterte, I always do comparative, right? I always compare him. Like on foreign policy, he's not as disciplined as this guy, but he's more disciplined as that guy, etc. Mm -hmm. And and I think that completely changed the uh, epistemological approach to this. You know? and, and for me, it really worked for me. Now with Marcos Jr., I'm kind of trying to connect what he's doing to counter revolutions in other places. It's still kind of working, but I'm doing more and more on that on that front. Or right? I comparing him to his father mm. in that comparative mm. sense. So for me, it's the the specter of comparison, right? Going back to si loading Rizal, no, mm. the, the demon, the specter of comparison, is is extremely helpful to for you to really cope with uh, emotionally and sometimes intellectually puzzling. So intellectually, I was never puzzled by Duterte. Like nothing with him surprising. Emotionally, I have been psychologically. Wow. But intellectually, precisely because I saw how things went down literally sometimes in other countries. And I felt, why, what makes us special? We are also a traumatized post-colonial nation, right? Mm. And we have our so, own... So, where is that idea that we have only in the Philippines? I mean, I think one reason... Yeah, go ahead. Because we were colonized by an exceptionalist country. So, there is a, such a thing in, as American exceptionalism, uh, right? And American. The rules oh, apply yeah. to everyone else, but they don't apply to America. It's very common. Or Americans think uh, of themselves right, as right, the center yeah. of the universe. So, like, for example, you know, dito sa US, I mean, sa Philippines, everybody's talking about 
global university rankings. Nobody mentions that in the U.S. We only really care about whether or not our rankings are close to our peer institutions in the U.S. And we only look at U.S. rankings. So that's one example of American exact exceptionalism. Um, in, in the cultural world, right, you, you feel like if, if you just study American literature, you have a handle. On literature because American literature is important. Yung parang ganun, American, yung American ex- exceptionalism, I don't know, namana ba natin yun or are we reacting uh, to that? Because our exceptionalism is not a kind of parang arrogant exceptionalism the way American exceptionalism American. is happening. Actually, our exceptionalism is kind of self-deprecating exceptionalism. Diba? So, bakit ganun? Yeah. There is this more, uh, uh, I won't say ethnocentric, it doesn't make sense, but it's more like self-centered, self-referential <laughs> exceptionalism. Ours is self-deprecating exceptionalism. Oh. Right? But nonetheless, both have this kind of exceptionalist, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, lens no? through which they, they try to understand. And you know, parang Americans don't want to learn much about the rest of the world. I noticed like you, you go to a uh, normal European capital, or even yeah. Middle Eastern capitals, the amount of knowledge you get with the, with the taxi cab folk, right, about the rest of the world is pretty high. Right, you, right. you tend not to get that in the United States. And I, and I haven't been to the less, uh, you know, less, let's say, less wealthy states in the U.S. I'm usually in the, you know, the, the usual suspects mm-hmm. like California, New York, the more wealthy parts of U.S. So I haven't even ch- checked the other parts. I was it in Dakota, for instance, right? Mm-hmm. Or, in, or in North Carolina, etc. Um, so like, like, you know, the sense of the horizons, the intellectual mm-hmm. horizons tend to be much wider in places like Europe, for mm-hmm. instance. Or in Singapore. So you're, you're, you're saying actually it's a kind of educational thing. I think um, yeah, it's, it's an orientation. And also language, right? How many Americans can speak mm-hmm. proper a second language aside from American, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in European high schools and universities, like you have to learn a new language. Like that's part of education. That's part of it. Like, alala ko ako sa Ateneo, three units lang yung foreign language. Oh, matutunan mo sa three units, yeah, right? That's... And then I remember we were benchmarked. Like there was some benchmarking. I was in a faculty meeting, and you know, like somebody said, well, if you look at other Jesuit universities, like for example, um, Georgetown, yeah. Yeah. their language requirement is two. To, uh, no, to, to, kailangan mo maging conversational. You can't graduate. Uh, so you, have, you have to have some bare proficiency. And then the Ateneo people were just like, oh, we're different from them, right? Parang gano, we're, yeah. This is a different university. Yeah, so that, there's something There's something in the waters of educational yeah. system that actually makes yeah. us a little bit That's more a, parochial. Yeah, that, that parochialism, I, I noticed. That. So in the Philippines, for instance, like, uh, we follow American elections very closely, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we follow NBA, etc. But how much do we care about elections in, in or selections in China, for instance, un- unless there's some scandal like what happened to Hu Jintao the other day? Uh, mm-hmm. Well, of course, for us, because of our job, we are obsessed about what's happening in China, the black box mm-hmm. of Chinese politics, because it has huge implication for the Philippines. Para mas malaki pang impact sa China kaysa sa atin, kaysa Amerika, no? So I just felt that was always weird na... Uh, and you know, like, and, and you look at it. You go to academic conferences or even civil society conference. You notice the Filipinos. Um, we really stand out, not necessarily for the best in the best ways when we're among ASEAN people, right? Like, we don't really share the ASEAN values of, you know, <laughs> diffidence. You know, like, you know, when you give your business card, you go like that. We're all you always had this swagger, uh, this mm. American swagger, and and that's something I that I heard, you know. Uh, some of our, our ASEAN friends, you know, the, the yeah. snidey ways, uh, mga, Pinoy, mga Filipinos, they're going to come with their American stuff. Yeah, that's, an old, you know that's yeah. an old tradition. That's an old tradition. In the Cambridge history of Southeast Asia, there's an anecdote there that a Filipino and an ASEAN conference declared themselves to not be Southeast Asians, not Asians, right? right. Parang we're, we're more American. So I guess part of it does come from American exceptionalism, this idea that we're unique. And, and in a sense, you know, like to, to entertain the argument, there is some truth in it. Like, for example, you, you know, we are, we, you can think of us as part of Latin America, especially in terms of, you know, you, you nationalist revolutions natin. Like the nationalist revolutions of Southeast Asia and Asia happened in the 20th century. Ours happened at the turn of the century, right? And, and, and the nationalism develops kind of really early alongside the nationalism of Latin America. So in a sense, meron namang point yung Filipino exceptionalism. But just because it has a point doesn't mean we have to we can't transcend it. And yeah. I think we should really start with, as you mentioned, scholarship so or teaching. So you know, concrete suggestions is like we should really be learning foreign languages. And then I have another suggestion 
Um, if you look at the Chen request, my, in my own field, I don't know if you can say something similar for your own field, but in my field, if you look at the Chen requirements for history, actually, yung units, uh, yung required units, so to be accredited as a history major, as a history program for any university, you have to follow the Chen requirements. And if you look at the Chen requirements, the majority of units are Philippine history units. You have Spanish history, you have American history, but you uh -huh. notice, why are you doing Spanish history? Why are you doing American history? In order to help understand Philippine history. So everything is geared right. towards Philippine history. And it, so effectively, we're not training historians in the Philippines. We're training yeah, Philippine, Philippine historians. historians. No, yeah. well, I'm, a, I'm a Philippine historian. It's okay to specialize, but I think we should open up the possibility for people doing other um, fields in history. So the great Horacio de la Costa, for example, his right. vision for... The Ateneo History Department before he got called off to um to, to Rome was he sent one of his students to study US his do a PhD in US history. He sent one of his students to do a PhD in Chinese history. Mm -hmm. He sent one of his students to do a PhD wow. in Latin American history. So the goal was all of these students would come back to Ateneo and then they would have a an inter a, a, a history program that mirrored global the history, history programs history. of global universities, yeah. wherein the history that was being studied was not just the history of the country, but the history of the world, right? And that was De La Costa's vision. So De La Costa was a, one of those kind of like outward thinking Filipino historians. And, you know, how I wish we could bring back. Wait, what back. happened? Did they come back? And then si, si hmm. Father Horacio himself got stuck in Rome, diba? And, um, <laughs> So hindi na niya na hindi na niya na mandohan yung history department na nagbago na yung trajectory. So that was that was kind of that was the tragedy for me of that the history department. Yeah, ako naman bro, the other thing na notice ko is syempre because of the South China Sea China issue, very constantly involved ako sa ASEAN related workshop, discussions, etc. So I became a de facto ASEANist because I just realized Philippines and US we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to carry the day. You know what I'm saying? We have to work. Ang daming, ex daming expert dyan. Napapaaway ka dyan pag nag-Philippines and US ka eh. Alam ka lang pamakawin sa mga eh. Quite a notorious too in the South China Sea studies, right? Uh, uh, so far, it's it's helping me naman. Career-wise, uh -huh. <laughs> okay, you know, so I have to go plain. Next time like, na yan. Like, bring, bring Hey Darian. He's gonna say the things you wanna hear but we cannot say, you know what I'm saying? So, maybe that's why I'm not in Singapore though. <laughs> um, no, I mean, speaking of this, like, when, you know, when I went with my Indonesian counterparts, Thai counterparts, um, until recently, right? You might visit because of Vietnam. They are, like, they're, they're so steep in the ASEAN history, emotionally. Oh, it's purely intellectual. Like, I like, but I was never as emotionally attached as them. Like, like I, like, I have Thai friends, no? In Mahidol or Chulalongo. Like, they talk about the, which foreign minister of theirs was there at this meeting in ASEAN. Ganun. Ako, pas, alam ko, pas, Ramos, yung isa sa founder. <laughs> Ganun lang ako, eh. But, of oh. course, I see the big picture, confronta si Ganun. Pero yung mga nitty-gritties, anong kinain nila nung 1981 before the Cambodian. Yung mga ganun. Uh, like they're so... And then, like, I feel so bad about myself. Like, yeah. bakit tayo ganun? And Part of it is may ASEAN section sila sa newspaper sila. I know Malaysia. Yun, and bro, yun, 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 exactly. But that's because their domestic news is kind of boring and sometimes censored. So they have an yeah. ASEAN section. Oh. So, yun yung spice nila, ASEAN. <laughs> like, oh. be better well, than as, that, man. <laughs> whereas again, to be fair to us, here's another reason why I think there's Philippine exceptionalism. We don't need to look for spice elsewhere. Our media is not censored. <laughs> we get scandals every day, right? So parang... Between the Inquirer, Star, and uh, you know Rappler front page, so ka na eh. you get all the yeah. cheese cheeseness you want. Bakit ka patitingin ng ASEAN? Even though ASEAN does get really spicy as well, you know, like right, right. Yung, yung Mahathir Anwar saga so has been like one of the most, yeah. one of the funnest news cycle sagas of all Dude. time. That Malaysia every every year asks, well, who's the latest sodomy case in your country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. What's with this sodomy? Everyone oh. says sodomy case. I don't know. Yes, I know. The like, and Mahathir is running again this oh. year for the elections, right? So like, oh my god. No, actually, you, you, that's why I kind of disagree with you. Maybe Thailand. I don't know, but. Dude, Indonesia too. They have a lot of mumbo jumbo going on there, bro. I mean, that's true. That's man, true. I, I, I'm, you're being see, you're being Filipino exceptionalist. I have to <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand the other side here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Malaysia is very spicy, bro. The whole Najib. Oh yeah. One. You think oh, yeah, Delta yeah. is yeah, that's spicy? Yung, yung Hermes bags lang ni, ni Madam oh, Najib. Oh, you know, like oh my goodness, like it's it's incomparable. Actually. 
<laughs> Actually, yung isa pa yun, di ba, yung parang Pilipinos, like, how could we re-elect the son of a kleptocrat? I mean, the Malaysians were about to not just elect the son of a kleptocrat, they were about to re-elect the kleptocrat himself. Yeah, Very exactly. Three years after leaving office, di ba? Najib almost became prime minister again, di ba? Just the fact that his party is back in power. So, itong never again, never forget this course sa Pilipinas. Yeah, it's no not about forgetting. Theory. The Malaysians didn't forget. You know, it happened three years, four years ago. Yeah, yeah. In that yeah. case. And they probably stole more than Marcos in one fell swoop. Well, we don't know, right? But, there's a chance. Well, I mean, the it's called the big whale for uh, the, you know for one you know, one MDB scandal, mm. right? But it's like DiCaprio Wolf of Wall Street. Kung sino oh. sino na apa ito ando, right? No, like yung ano pa nsa bro, like this this um this Philippine exceptionalism syndrome, let's call it that way. It it it, it, it infects everyone, right? Of all classes, all professions, right? Uh, you can see it in the legal profession. You can see it in the academic profession. I, I see it in all of my anecdotal evidence. But pag mga Pinoy na abogado nandun sa meeting ng ASEAN, they're like the American swagger one. Ah, and it's yes. like the Singaporeans, how are you, la? And then like they go on debating. Because you know? in well, Philippines, a, you have to do grad school, right? In other there's country, a very sp- undergrad lang yung law school nila. So may uh, mga discrimination din nangyari, di ba? But there's a very specific reason for the parochialism of Philippine law. It's 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 a constitutional one, and that's and, and simple. We don't mm. allow foreign lawyers to practice in the Philippines. Ah, yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, yeah. one of my friends, one of my close yeah, friends, says, you know, you want to improve Philippine legal practice, change the constitution, or amend the constitution, or I don't know, amend the law interpreting the yeah. constitution as such. I don't know where the ban comes from, but allow foreign lawyers to practice in the Philippines and appear in Philippine courts. See how quickly the legal culture will change. Will change. And hindi siya parochial, uh, na, na pseudo-American, na, uh, na ano, na mga, ano yung mga suits, mga ganun-ganun series. Uh, na, ano, yung, ano, like, panyero culture. Yeah, everyone stop the Lexus and the, all. Like, but watch Singaporean lawyers. Like they're so different. Yeah. Sila mga businessman. Oh, maka- yeah. Yan, Very and then black. finally, people will refer to pe- other other lawyers as Mr. and Miss. And not yes, the attorney, attorney. 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 Lawyers. Yeah. You have been strong on that, right? The title thing with the Philippines. Like even architect, even like, <laughs> even, <laughs> come on, man. come on. Tama na yan, di ba? Para ba yung architect, engineer, meron pa yung doctor, professor, uh, uh, blah, 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 like, come on, man. Let me... Yeah, like that, uh, it's the feudalism is very strong. You can, yeah. see. can you tell us more about that? You've been strong on that. Come on. I, you know, no, I, I just think like, you know, again, if we compare from for other countries, hindi naman ganun ka-hierarchical yung speech nila, di ba? And I just feel like when... when Germans ever, are like that, bro. Germans are like that's that. True, like, but, that's true, but... So that's... So the point is, we have a choice, right? We have a choice which culture to emulate. Do we emulate the cultures that are obsessed with titles or do we emulate the cultures that are not not obsessed with titles? And I feel that because we have a choice, because any culture is developing, we should develop our culture in a more democratic fashion. So, you know, like, I I never sign off as Professor Claudio, Dr. Claudio, or I I have never placed... I only did it once and I was so ashamed of it. I've never placed the PhD polynomials after my name. It's just, I find it so grotesque. I find it like parang so insecure whenever it's done. So I just don't, I, I, I don't do it because I don't want to reinforce the hierarchy. And, you know, if you're reading me, if you're listening to me, don't look at my titles, read the content. If you're persuaded, yeah. then I'm good for you. If you think it's trash, then regardless of what my title is, you're going to think it's trash, right? I think that's, I think that's a good way to approach public discourse. Oh, bro, let me. Because I have been trying to understand where is this coming from, uh, and I saw there's a practical aspect to it too. Like if you put your titles on, but the security guard will take you more seriously. <laughs> oh, Let's be honest, oh, right? Like if you oh. say I'm an attorney, or you're like media or professor, immediately you see the interaction is different, right? Ah, mm-hmm. uh, konya, my traffic violations ka, or late ka pumasok dun sa parking lot. I'll be honest, I saw the practicality of this, how people deployed, also for a practical reason, not only for reinforcing psychological hierarchies or cultural hierarchies. And in a country like ours, whereby connections, everything matters, and the law is in the eyes of beholder, I cannot blame people trying to leverage that. But you're absolutely right. How can we have an egalitarian society like that? Kaya gusto ko yung American culture. Everyone is first name basis. I don't care if you're the top professor in Harvard Law School. I don't care you're going to be on first name basis and they insist on first name basis like they feel uncomfortable if you call them 
even with Mr. and Miss, but their last name. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. one thing I really love about American culture. I mean, like, you know, there's many things in America that turns you off. I'm sure you also share that. But there are also some very beautiful, like, egalitarian aspects of American society that always, always uh, left me awestruck that I didn't see in our fellow Asian countries or, or among Europeans too. Though, uh, the Brits also have a lot of feudalism going on there. Even accent pa lang, they, they hire. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. Oh my you know, God, I also have Brits uh, compared, yeah. compared to Americans. Yeah. I think uh, we're, we're running out of time and I want to get to our last section. So we, we're going to have a fun exactly section for this yeah. podcast. Pero parang, I, I have one last question for you. you bro. I, I gave a couple of suggestions now about how to kind of like, let's be constructive here. Like, okay, Philippine exceptionalism is a problem. What are your solutions, Richard? Ako, I, I said like, okay, Chad, make sure that more of the courses are in the yeah, nice. Ginagawa na yan. Meron ng course on the contemporary world. And that's, that's great, di ba? And I think there should be more of those. And I think Um, languages should be a priority. You should allow for people to study history and hindi lang yeah. Philippine history. You should allow for, I don't know what it's like in poli sci, but there should, you should allow people to become political scientists of other countries trained in the Philippines. So, right. yung, 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 yung aking yes. constructive suggestions, education. Ikaw, anong, anong, what are your suggestions? Yeah, going, before going to me, I, I'm interested because you did textbooks, right? You do textbooks. That's, that's yeah, what yeah. I, did, I haven't done yet. You have done textbooks. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I I actually was the first draft was the first drafter of the uh-huh. curriculum ng Ched for the well, contemporary yeah. world. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, yung, if you go online and if you search for yung draft syllabus, yung official draft syllabus ng Ched for that, that's being used in all colleges except for the Pasco exempt ones. Right. Yung nag-design, ako yung syllabus na yun. And the reason for that is because oh. I thought it was such a great idea on the part of our administrators to create a course like that. It was so crucial to treat Philippine exceptionalism that I just had to find a way to get involved. So I I volunteered for it. I looked for the people in the technical committee who were working on it. And I said, I just I just want in on this. I just like want to do this. Um, and then that was some of the most rewarding years of my life for I think two summers I was training teachers across the country on how to teach the contemporary world course and then after those teacher trainings yeah. I, I did I think I did one big one in Cebu I did another big one in Manila I sat I think my internet has a problem oh that um should I take it from the top of the no Nakamute ka. Sorry about that. Parang na-disconnect. Anyway, we're almost done, di ba? Um, yeah, so the textbook, can you again repeat the textbook part? Yeah. Yeah, so, yun nga. So, after I did the teacher training in Cebu and in Manila, and then kinaskade yun, yung mga teachers na training ko, trained other teachers. So, uh, grabe, parang yung feeling of satisfaction na I'm really right. doing to change the curriculum and to change the way people are educated in the Philippines. I just felt like I had to write a textbook about it because people were approaching me and they were saying, kailan namin ng materials, not just the materials you assign, but a material that's more friendly for teachers na naka-outline na lahat. So, wow, sumulat ako with Jojo ng textbook um, on the contemporary world. And it's still available, you know. Um, Of course, the other incentive for doing it, if we're being honest, is is you know textbooks are quite lucrative. Pero pero shari naman yan niya kasi lucrative ng basic education. But it was a it was a good way to augment my lasal salary at that time. And and, and come on, it puts you on the map, right? In in many ways, and it's a kind of a legacy thing, right? Iba iba yeah, talaga yeah. textbook, eh, yeah. That's yeah. how historians make a whole Tapos, career, right? Ay, alam mo, Richard, yung pinaka-touching for me during the, ano, during the pandemic, napansin ko ang daming YouTube video ng mga chapter summaries, ng mga, cha- ng mga textbook oh, wow. chapters. Kasi during the pandemic, yung pinagawa ng mga teachers sa kanila, yeah. summarize through wow. YouTube. Tumingin ako YouTube. Like, there are dozens, maybe even hundreds, 
Eh, naubos yung oras ko, kakapanood lang ng, you know, a Moro, a, a Moro kid summarizing our textbook, a Cebuana kid summarizing our textbook, a Davawenya kid summarizing our textbook. It was just the most Precisely, beautiful and yeah. stunning experience. Um, pero yeah, thank, thanks for asking about that. Ibabalik ko dun sa tanong. Uh, what's yeah. your intervention, Richard? Like, how do you think, it's not a problem to be solved naman, I think, but it's it's a, it's a, it's a kind of discourse that needs to be improved if you, if you want to be constructive. Like, what's your constructive um, suggestion for how to encourage Filipinos to think more globally? Yeah, ako naman, bro, for me, I always believed in human agency. No, I mean, there's, there's a Middle Eastern proverb that says, from God, the blessing, but from man, the action, right? The move, right? So the, the sense of agency, even for faithful, pious people is, is, is very important. And for me, the problem with us is that our Philippine exceptionalism reinforces the lack of agency. It, it kind of gives you an impression that uh, uh, nasa dugo natin na, uh, you know, we are just victims of our circumstances. You know, yung, yung mga ganun na talagang uh, rotten to the core yung political culture natin. So, ako, by comparing us to other countries and showing that we're actually not the worst. We do we, and, and, and the second, there were countries who were worse than us, but now doing better than us. Korea. Simple lang, ibig sabihin nun. Forget about Korea, like Turkey, for instance, right? Like, I, I can talk about Brazil or Latin American countries. Like, uh, so if these countries can do better than us when we were better than them a few decades ago, siguro medyo Korea super malayo na, di ba? Uh, medyo upper middle income na lang tignan natin. Or Thailand, right? Which was behind us in 1950s and 60s and now a little bit ahead of us, but significant enough. And Vietnam, we just took over. Like when you look at these countries now very comparable, sad and relatable, that gives you an idea na nothing is set in stone. It's really about getting the right policies, getting the right leadership, getting the right innovations and in policies. So ako ganun talaga ang tingin ko. Like, when you do that, you saturate your analysis with agency, a sense of ownership. Then we Filipinos can feel more responsible about, about our voting, about who becomes our leaders, about pressuring them. Because bro, for me, the biggest enemy is cynicism. And cynicism mm -hmm. and self-deprecation go together. The moment we're stuck with that, we'll never grow. Kaya ako, when I'm abroad, parating kung sinisabi na ang dami natin OFWs na kaibigan, etc. Pero puro mga restaurants, owned by Thai, Vietnamese, and Chinese. Bakit tayo Filipinos mm. ay gumagawa ng sarili ng restaurant natin? Kasi for me, it's weird. I go to a Thai restaurant, lahat ng staff Pinoy. Tapos yung mga ibang food naman nila, it's actually Pinoy. It's not Thai. Sabi ko, bakit tayo mismo hindi gumawa, di ba? So, yun nga yung point ko. Eh, na if the Thai and Vietnamese can do it, why can't we, right? Y yun ang point ko. So, uh, for me, the best education, whether it's in basic education, whether it's in public discourse, is to give the Filipino people a sense of agency, to remind us that actually we're not the worst, we're more in the middle of the pack, and we can make it to the upper third of the world on many key rankings if we learn the right lessons and do not repeat the wrong mistakes. And the upper third for me is fine. I don't want us world domination per se, but if we can be in the top 50 countries in the world in key indicators, economic competitiveness, HDI, etc., I'll be very happy, and I think we can give a good life to the Filipino people. Yun lang naman sa akin, hindi ang suntok sa buwan, Kaya kaya natin yun. So it's really about strengthening a sense of agency by drawing lessons from all around the world, best practices and worst practices. Yeah. That yeah. way, oh, for me, we can really learn and move forward. Yeah. That, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, best practices and just drawing inspiration and not giving up. If That's the other thing with comparison. If you compare enough, you're not going to give up on your country. And that's not elitist whatsoever. And that's a, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a great <laughs> case. conversation. <laughs> But before, before we started the podcast, uh, listeners, I, I insisted to Richard na meron tayo kasi digressive personalities kami. So kailangan gumawa ng space towards yeah. the end. Uh, parang open question lang. What are you thinking about this week? What kind of trivia are you concerned with? Um, what are you writing? Anything at all. What are you thinking about this yeah. week, Richard? No, ako, I'm still in the afterglow of the UFC fight over the weekend because the, the uh -huh. ultimate fight between uh, Charles Oliveira and Islam Makachev was really a showdown between jiu-jitsu and wrestling. And ah. wrestling won, right? So ah, yeah, yeah, I'm really yeah. thinking about that very deeply, right? As, as a martial arts enthusiast, etc., lifelong followers of these things, as someone who doesn't have a grappling skills and is really a striker really by training, I look at that and say, hmm, should I invest more in wrestling or should I learn more in B BJJ, right? And I think that's relevant because you just came from a training. Yeah, training. yeah, so yeah, yeah. Just, I really encourage you to follow that because that's the big yeah. debate. Should you learn yeah, jiu-jitsu yeah. or wrestling? Yeah. So so I actually trained, I just started jiu-jitsu mga three months, but 
in the beginning of every jujitsu session that we have in my gym, there's a there's a there's stand up wrestling because it's so important as a complement to jujitsu, and that's largely because my gym uh, is called Straight Blast Gym. It's actually sure. the gym of Conor McGregor. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you yeah, guys, yeah. Are the best one in California. Like, yeah, it's not mega dope, naman. Oh, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, Rand, in the early day, days of SBG, Randy Couture used to train with the jujitsu yeah. people at so Straight Blast Gym, and he, I think, introduced. Um, wrestling done. So, so you know, before we get on the ground, we're doing wrestling pummels, head control. Oh. Um, that, that, that's fun. So okay. I, I, I am picking oh. up some wrestling and, and it's yeah, been yeah. fun. Um, yeah. Now so I'm jealous. Talking? Now I'm properly jealous, right? The combining. It's a Philippines because I have no insecurity because we have the best boxers here. I have no problem learning boxing. I have no problem learning Muay Thai. But when it comes to grappling, you know, like I'm not very sure right? if I can get the best trainer. I get out. I have friends in San Jose who say that si Khabib used to train in their area, the right? Si Narma Gamet, the right? Like so, he, he trained in San Jose. Yeah. So, so I don't think if I go to California or something, that's one of the things I want to do, right? Some BJJ training and all, right? Yeah. What's uh, I mean, like Filipinos are there? There is a significant BJJ scene, man, in the Philippines, yes. and I think Filipinos compete. Bro. Compete well. There's nothing about uh, kind of Filipino physiognomy that prevents us from being excellent uh, jujitsu, having excellent jujitsu. Japanese game. sports, yeah, we're Brazilian. So we're both right. We're both Asian and Latino. It's perfect for us. Amazing, amazing. I think BJJ. I think BJJ is more natural for us than wrestling. Yeah, yeah. Actually, oh. Russians, Middle Easterns are very good in that, right? Kasi diba, Greco, malaki pa rin sila, diba? Yeah, it's really bulky people. So, it, so my genetic factor, disadvantages, advantages you can talk about. But BJJ is perfect for us Filipinos. We may not have the width, the big necks, and all of that naturally. But with technique, we can win the way, uh, the day, hopefully. No? So, yun yung para sa akin. BJJ is, I think, perfect for us. Brazil and Japan, we can both relate to that, bro. Okay, I'm, I'm so excited. So can I go? My, my turn? You yes. Know, what, what I'm thinking about? Yeah. I've been thinking of, I'm writing a piece on uh, wine and I've been, I've been thinking about the most influential critic, wine critic of the 1990s for the boomer generation. His name was yeah. Robert yeah. Parker. And he liked, because this was the age, and there's a connection to neoliberalism because this was the age of the 1990s. This was the age of excess, Wolf of Wall Street. Everything had to be big. And so the wines that um, okay. that Parker liked were like, High alcohol, inky, very heavy wines, very fruity wines. So he liked the big Napa Cabernets. He liked the the Bordeaux blends. These were these are like blow out your palate wines because they're they're Dionysian and you eat them with steak. So it's it's really a product of the 1990s. But uh, so so that influenced wine drinking in the Philippines. And right. so if you notice, you go to Rustans, the most expensive bottles there are Bordeaux. And Napa cabs. I wouldn't but, know. I'm not elitist. Eh. Yeah, and, uh, but, <laughs> I'm gonna but, get out there. But, 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 but anyway, <laughs> I, anyway, what happened? So the crisis, the crisis happens, right? Yeah, uh, and so yeah. it was a time of restraint. And so um, during from that time onward, you get the emergence of kind of new wine or restrained wine, yeah, wine right? So lower alcohol content, more drinkable, and. I'm writing a piece about how we negotiate this trend because I think this trend is very good for us because the platonic ideal of what, what to pair with Filipino food is SMB Pale Pilsen. Nick Joaquin settled that debate ages yeah. ago. Yeah. So if wine is becoming more, if the cool wine is moving away from heavy wine, the you know the Parker neoliberal wines, and moving towards restrained wines that are more acidic, more drinkable, lower in alcohol, lower in tannin content, I think that that's very, very good for Filipinos and good for the Filipino palate, good for Filipino food. So, you know, it's just a good moment in wine for Filipinos to engage the wine world. That's what I'm thinking about this week. Do you see yourself getting more, I mean, this is looking like a passion project to you, right? Uh, is, there, is there something going on there? Do you see yourself getting more involved in this, in the, the food scene, food diplomacy, the cuisine thing? Is it something new in your life? Because I, I've been a geek through and through. Now I'm going to appreciate now the finer things in life, right? I'm not feeling guilty. I used to always... <laughs> mag, mag, uh, when I was in Australia, I picked up a coffee habit because yeah. it was a coffee scene. And then I'm going to go to So I, I, I really feel like, you know, we cultivate, we should cultivate all our senses. Like, you know, we, 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 yeah. we view art, we listen to good music. 
And so we should cultivate our tongues and our noses. So we should have a cultivated sense of flavor because that's that's a that's an element of sense that we rarely explore. And I think wine and coffee are good ways to explore that sense and have and really connect with that sense. And Lanon and coffee scene in the Philippines is really changing. Like Mount Apo is picking up, you know, like I really there, there's this rising star in the Philippines, so Mount Apo. Who's working with like really strange ferment or innovative fermentation? I think her name is Cherry Cabandai. Like when I'm in the Philippines, or if there's anyone kind enough to send me some of her coffee from the Philippines, I'd really appreciate it because I'm looking forward. And some of these, you know, some of these bring for you like processes that they're doing in Mount Apo are similar to kind of like yung mga anaerobic processing that they do for for natural wines, like you know, like like what the anaerobic processing that they do in the Beaujolais region for gamay grapes. Some yeah. of that processing is being done for coffee beans in the Philippines, in Mount Apo. It's amazing. And I just can't wait to taste to go back to the Philippines and taste all these new Philippine coffees that are that are diversifying the coffee world and that are giving actually um non-lowland Tagalog coffee, uh, the kind of the kind of pride of place that they deserve. Well, uh, I, I suddenly I'm beginning to hate this part. Parang sabi ko, hindi dapat naging trivia to. This looks like a serious podcast series in itself, no? So hopefully, I can go get back to this on, uh, on I think the issue of food, food diplomacy, Filipino food cuisine, I think it's something that we can seriously discuss in an episode, no? Yeah, yeah. No. Let's do that. No, no, because I'm, I'm feeling passionate in the bodies, especially the food diplomacy issue. I did a TEDx talk on that, comparing, uh, you know, the case of Thailand, Korea. I feel we have to do a series on that. And I, I know my mga bash na naman tayo itong dalawang ano na naman to mga ADD na to ano, like the Renaissance man, di ba? I think Renaissance men were attention to people, right? It's, it's, a, it's a politically correct. These Renaissance men are getting their fingers dipped into many cookie jars. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah, let's do that, bro. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. That's so much fun. Yeah, I mean, you should say thank you to me too because this is a conversation. Oh. <laughs> so, thank you oh. to me and thank you to you. Thank you. Oh. So this is just, uh, ano lang, this is like just a trailer, teaser lang of giving ideas. So, parang this is the rationale why we're even doing this podcast or we thought about this. So hopefully every week or at, at most every fortnight, kind of London Review style, we'll come up with an analysis of the latest global issues and then connect it to the Philippines or the other way around. A major mm -hmm. Philippine issues and what are the global implications and what is the global picture. So we're hoping to, I'm thinking maybe Nexus will be a good way of describing what we're trying to do here, right? I, I think that's that's right. something also close to your heart, right? I've seen absolutely. My name is Sanad, bro. Have a good night. Sanad, bro. Get some rest yeah. from your BJJ. Oh, sige. Natutulog na ako. Ginulpe, ginulpe ako ng high school kid <laughs> kanina sa jiu-jitsu. So pagod na ako. Okay. Send us picture, bro. Yan lang yan. It's a podcast. Okay. Sige. BJJ, bro. Bye. Have a good day. God bless, bro. Thank you. Bye.